it's a pleasure and an honor to once again welcome Satish ji amongst us. He has spoken a few times in this hall, but it has always been to the students and teachers primarily. And so this time, since he happened to be here over the weekend on a Sunday, we thought it would be an ideal opportunity for the wider ashram community to also listen to Satish ji. And in the spirit of this morning's talk, it is a much more personal sharing of Satish ji's story right from the time he visited Pondicherry as a young boy and uh, met the mother and I won't speak more about that. I will let him do the honor of telling his story. I will just read out briefly his professional background for those of you who may not be aware. So Lieutenant General Satish Tua, PVSM, UYSM, SM, VSM was a former Corps Commander in Kashmir who retired as Chief of Integrated Defence Staff. A counter-terrorism specialist, General Dua has commanded his unit as well as a brigade in active militancy in Jammu and Kashmir in line of control and counter-terrorism environment. As Chinar Corps, Corps Commander in Kashmir, he was responsible for planning and execution of the surgical strikes and controlling the huge unrest post-elimination of Burhan Wani. As Major General, he raised and commanded a new counter-terrorism division of Assam Rifles in the Northeast to coordinate operations in three states of Northeast. The General was also a commando instructor as a captain and Indian Defence Attaché in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos as Colonel. He is a keen sportsman, fond of horse riding and an adventure sports enthusiast to include skydiving, skiing, parachute jumping and mountain biking. During his career, General Dua has been awarded with the Vishisht Seva Medal, Sena Medal, Uttam Yudh Seva Medal and Param Vishisht Seva Medal for his service to the nation. So it is with great pleasure, sir, that we invite you to kindly uh, speak to us this morning. A 
values, in his upbringing at home, parents, and then teacher. I learnt uh, or I inherited a great but a very strong sense of beauty from my father. My father was in the Air Force. He uh, he was an Indian mechanic, aircraft Indian mechanic, but he was very good in his work, very dedicated, and that's why he was trusted by his superiors much beyond his brief. I have actually given a talk around this in a Josh talk. Josh talk is a Indian version of TED Talks. My father brought me here when I was not yet 13. He was posted in Tamra, Chennai, and one of his friends told him about Sri Aurobindo Ashram, about Divine Mother, and this is 1970 or 71 that he came here. And I mean, right from day one, small anecdotes that I remember, we were walking on what is now called the beach road, the boulevard, and uh, we were looking for, I remember Kanayada, there used to be a theatre, there still is a theatre, very close to the park house, Ashram Theatre, and uh, we, we were looking for the place, and a car came and stopped next to us, a car in 1970, 71. Those days, we hardly found any two-wheelers on road and somebody saw a man with his wife and three children, my younger brother and youngest sister. We were all walking on the seaside and he says, Woman, are you looking for something? And when we, told, uh, when we told him, he actually gave a lift in his car and brought us to that. It's called theatre, right? Theatre, theatre, yeah, theatre there. And I remember this with Kanaya Dada then. There was one room that he was using. He gave us that room and I think he slept, put a cot outside in a very nice veranda. And that's where we stayed for I think 15 or 20 days. As children, I just remember going around the seaside and playing over there. Uh, you know, when my mother would be helping with dishes in the, uh, the dining hall, uh, we would try and unobtrusively play hide and seek in the courtyard. Samadhi was always a sober experience. But there also, I, all I recall is uh, trying to, uh, in my young mind, I, I was, you know, comparing how much a French courtyard looks like an Indian angan and things like that. I remember going to the playground, seeing a movie there, Sherlock Holmes, I still remember. But one day, and this was in the second visit, all of that changed when we got our name for Pranam went up to the mother's room as many of many sitting over here do know and others I'm sure have heard of it. So that few seconds that one placed my head on a lap and I still remember the sensation of her hands on my head before I walked out. That is a sensation, the feeling I can never forget. It has it has carried me through all along in my life. I think I just grew up in that moment. Maybe when you are 14, you just want to act grown up also, but then I just grew up that moment. Mother made me a soldier after that. Literally. I joined a medical college. I got a scholarship seat after my uh, schooling. It, there was no entrance test in Karnataka those days. I got a scholarship seat and everyone said, you'll be a fool to pass it up. And how can you not go for a medical college? Everybody wants to be a doctor. My father wanted one son to be a doctor, the other to be an engineer, the other one has actually fulfilled his dream. My younger brother is an engineer. But I joined the medical college, but I wanted to become a pilot. I went for the NDA entrance exam, uh, went for the interview in Mysore. I, my college was in Bellari. And coincidentally, it is during the Christmas holiday break that I got a call letter from the National Defense Academy. And I came home and I requested my parents, I need to go to the Army, uh, Air Force, then it was NDA. It is much later that I changed to Army for a different reason, I wanted to. That's how I became a soldier. As a soldier I remember, and I'm very fortunate that I started going to a site, a line, they have read out, I got into counter-terrorism. In the Army also, everyone, each soldier or officer does not get a chance to be in combat. There are many branches, many trades. So 
Some may go to combat, some may not. I was fortunate enough to go to a battalion, a location that I was posted to, uh, were in combat always. As a young captain, once I was in Kupwara, Kupwara is North Kashmir, on the line of control, uh, deployed in a post. What is a post? A post is a group of bunkers on top of a mountain peak and where you are trying to cover the line of control. As you understand, line of control is, is contested between Pakistan and India. So you actually physically hold places like that. It's unlike the international border in Punjab or Rajasthan where you have a no man's land in between. So here you physically control and you hear or read in the news about a lot of firing that takes place. We fire at each other sometimes. There are issues between the bordering outposts. So it's a little tough living both from climate and when bullets are flying, artillery shells are firing. But what also that you have to combat something is, is loneliness. You live there, you live there for months at a stretch and uh, as an officer you may have 20 men or 25 men a platoon that would be the biggest uh, uh, post you would, you would have the neighboring one will be two three kilometers away and one of the best now when i look back i see one of the things that even youngsters talk about today or we used to talk about then is loneliness after all as an officer how much will you sit with the men you felt alone and remember it is not like today you have mobile phones some kind of internet connectivity or some uh, some phone connectivity we did not have landlines at home those days there was no internet so everything was about writing a letter and which arrived 10 days later to their destination but when i look back even now i find it a little uh, strange but very pleasant to narrate that i never felt lonely Somehow, I do not say that I always kept praying to mother, not always. The, what I am trying to relate is that I have always felt that the sentences that I have heard from uh, mother or present on the calendar here and there, that made my life. I am near you. Open yourself to my care and it will never fail you. Those who have looked upon me shall grieve no more. I mean, these are the sentences that are imprinted in my mind and I have lived my life like that. I have literally risked my life several times over just for this belief and it has carried me. Once uh, I was commanding my planet. A commanding officer is a colonel. So when I was promoted to a colonel, this is 1998, when I was commanding I, I became the commanding officer of my battalion. Our battalion had moved, uh, moved from Port Blair to the line of control in JNK. I, within seven day or ten days of my becoming the commanding officer of the battalion, we had our first encounter with terrorists. That was a very terrorist infested area. We had our first encounter with terrorists and I lost an officer. The morale of the battalion was shattered. All my soldiers were feeling very low. I lost a very bright young officer, Major Rohit Chama. I felt very low that day myself. Uh, I couldn't sleep that night. Somewhere in about wee hours of the morning, 10 to the night, I, I, was, I was praying to mother and I just didn't know what to do. Imagine you become the commanding officer and straightway you have a lot of dreams. Everyone aspires to be commanding officer of your own battalion, which I did. You will aspire to lead your men in combat, which I did. But first day, first day, first show, I lost an officer. It happened on my watch. I was praying to mother and suddenly this sentence formed in my mind. I used this sentence often. How can you despair now? Your soldiers I realized my soldiers are looking up to me for leadership. So I pulled myself together and the next morning I had collected the soldiers that I had at the base and this is what I told them. I said yesterday we lost a brave young leader who took a bullet in his chest while leading from the front but his sacrifice did not go waste because not a single civilian was hurt. His 
sacrifice saved a few soldiers' lives. It happened. He led from the front, led the charge. What is the best way? As we grieve his loss, what is the best way to pay homage to such a martyr? I said the best way to pay homage to such a martyr is to carry on his mission, to ensure that not a single terrorist can operate, remain alive to operate in our area of responsibility. Look at what we did in Siachen and I extolled, exhorted them with 10 years before that my battalion had conducted the highest attack in the world at 21,000 feet on the Siachen Glacier where we got one Paramit Chakra and many other awards. So I told them this is the kind of history that we have and what we are going to do, we are going to do just that. This is how we will pay homage to Major Rohit Sharma. Well, those were just words that day. Little did I know that my words are going to be prophetic. In the next three years that I commanded the battalion over there, we have set a record in Northern Command, Northern Military Command. We have set a record of 106 kills per list. That, that was our job. When I look back, today, I see more clearly as to how uh, we did what we did. In the next encounter with terrorists, which was uh, I think about 10 or 15 days later, I, I did not wear a bulletproof jacket. Now there are instructions, no soldier can go into battle, into an encounter without wearing a bulletproof jacket. I just didn't wear a bulletproof jacket. I, that was foolish. I was acting braver than I felt. But because of that, when the troops saw, the soldiers saw their commanding officer leading the front without wearing a bulletproof jacket, they all wanted to give him their best. And I saw such a different energy from then on in my battalion. My young officers wanted to exceed themselves, soldiers wanted to outdo them, and we stroked up a positive cycle of bravery. And that is where I, I realized that even a wrong thing, a wrong act, what I did was wrong in terms of orders and instructions and the SOPs and drills by not wearing a bulletproof jacket, but even if you did something wrong, your soldiers also saw through the intent. If the intent is right, they would give in their best. After I finished the command of my battalion, three years, I was posted to Mao, a small military station near Indore. When I was to travel to Indore, uh, traveling to Indore, uh, uh, before traveling to Indore, we had gone on a few days holiday to Delhi, meet my parents, and we had decided that I will come back for a day. We packed a house where we used to live in Jammu. I had, I would come back for a day, uh, hire a truck, put my luggage in the truck, take the night train back to Delhi, and then we would, my car was there, and we were to drive to Mau, so that my luggage would arrive at the same time. I arrived at Jammu railway station in the morning, and suddenly I felt. Uh, you know, have I been too ambitious in planning? I had to go home. I had to go to the Truckers Union. This is 2001. We still did not have mobile phones. Uh, not in Jammu. In Delhi, Bombay, we had some. And so I had to drive to Truckers Union, hire a truck, uh, do a wee, wee bit of packing that was left. And I actually developed a bit of cold feet then as to uh, will I be able to manage all this and the next reservations were made and everything was uh, planned and then slowly the train got a little delay 30 more minutes I when I went there uh, walking out by that time my, my panic started increasing I started magnifying my fears as I got out I bought a newspaper at the newspaper store the railway station I bought a newspaper and he gave me some change the moment 
gave me some change and I'm trying to see my purse now. So I got this change and I get this coin. It's still with me. Normally you take a coin and put it in your pocket. This is a one rupee coin. And come here. I get this coin and I look at this and suddenly I was assured that nothing will happen. What is this? Say that now. I got a coin of Shriya Windows coin. I'm, I'm sure there was a very thank you, Mitra. I this is I'm sure there was a very limited edition. I did not see very many of these coins. Except when you take a coin, you don't really look at it. I remember I saw this coin. This was oh, mother is telling me, don't worry, son. You can in panic for last 45 minutes unnecessary. Everything will be done. Everything happened so smoothly that by evening I had a couple of hours to spare. The truck had gone, everything, and before I had a train to get. I have realized that in my life, and since then, this coin has uh, always been in my world. Uh, I have realized in my life, big or small, I always get, uh, I get guidance from one. I, my father tells me, it is because you feel that way. And I am so glad if I feel that way. The point I am trying to make, it is not only in bigger situations, it's small decisions in personal life. I've always felt that I, I will be able to go get to. They did mention, and uh, some of you perhaps heard earlier, I was a co-commander in Kashmir uh, in 2016, 15 and 16. Uh, just to explain, I was in charge of all the military that is stationed, the Rashtra Army, Rashtra Rifles, that is stationed in the whole of Kashmir, headquartered at Sirinagar those years. Then. So when I say Uri, what are you reminding of? Have you seen the movie? Yeah. So you remember that? Uri. I'm sure. When I say Uri, you all think of that a very nice feeling that that movie whipped up in the whole nation. Right? Very nice patriotic sentiment that was awakened. But when I think of Uri, for me, it is a very dark day. It was a dark Sunday for me on 18th of September 2016. When I was woken up by a phone call very early in the morning, four suicide terrorists had entered uh, uh, one of our army camps back on the line of control and we lost 18 soldiers, 19 died in the hospital two days later. Loss of 19 young lives, what a sad place and it happened on my watch. I was the Pokemon. I can still feel the pain and that day uh, I got a call at about, I went to Moody, took a chopper, went to Moody, it was still burning, there was a lot of the firing had stopped but the fires were burning. I uh, came back and I got a call from the defense secretary saying uh, the uh, the, Raksha Mantri, the defense minister will be arriving there. And my first reaction, I told him, why, why today? I mean that wasn't really the best time for me. I said, why today? But he said he's already taken off and Mr. Manohar Parikar Mr. Manohar Parikar called us soon and he was coming. The army chief was already in the air. Well, Mr. Parikar came and that, uh, when I tried to brief him, he wanted to go to Woody. I said, no, you can't, it's not safe. And then we came to my option. In that short 10 minutes flight, helicopter flight from the airport to Badami Bar Cantonment where my operations room was, because you are sitting in a helicopter, you can't talk to each other. I was thinking over it. And I decided. I mean, or, or I thought, it is it is actually a black day for me. It's such a dark day. But how how would mother want me to respond? How would how how do I get over this? And it just came to me in a flash. I was not happy with the defense minister coming there that day. But the fact is that today is the moment when the country was, the whole country was incensed 
at Pakistan sponsored terrorism. There was such a lot of anger in the nation. The leadership was agitated. My soldiers wanted revenge. And we decided to use or turn this pain into an opportunity. And when I was briefing Mr. Parikar in my operations room, he said, Yes, he can. Ab kya karna hai? I said, I'd like to brief you in my office for that because there are too many people here. He says, Yes, I'd like to go to your chamber. And in my office, there was only the army chief, me, and the army commander. So we were, and he asked me, he asked the army chief, gave him a broad generality. I said, Okay, DG, I'm cutting it. And he asked me only two questions. Allow me not to tell you the first one, which is uh, beyond this uh, purview of this talk. The second question, he says, or second point he made, there should be no casualties. I said, yes, sir. I agree with you. There should be no casualties. But I can't guarantee anything. It's war. Anything can happen. You're going across. And in 10 days, Whatever preparations, practice, training, coordination we did. In 10 days, we launched what is now, the children said it, what is now known as surgical strikes. We, Army, I, we did not give the name surgical strikes. We, I did not even do the operation. Normally we have a wood rose, cactus, water lily, something. We don't, I didn't give any name at all. I wanted it to remain like that. And now it's gone. That, then on, uh, I will not go into the military or the political part of it and so many things and thereafter Bala Kota, that's not the point. I am only talking about the fact that when I was in a situation, uh, how I was guided to do what I felt was correct and I hope uh, it said something else. Uh, before I end, let me just say <laughs> one last thing. It was widely expected, I was to move on promotion a couple of months, a month and a half before this foodie happened. Uh, because of the valley was burning, because of a, a huge name of a terrorist leader called Buran Wani was killed. If you may recall in 2016, the valley burned the whole summer. I was asked to stay on there extra, uh, for extra time. And it is during that time that foodie happened. I was widely expected to go as army commander, northern commander. But uh, it just happened that I was then posted to Delhi as Chief of Integrated Defence Staff on promotion. Initially disappointed, but then I, it opened up uh, my mind to a very different exposure. And just to briefly tell you, because that uh, is not broad exposure. And today, you have you all heard or read about the Chief of Defence Staff being appointed? General Rawat is the first Chief of Defence Staff. I was fortunate to push this entire thing. I held that post. I held that post, but it was not chief. It is one rung lower. For the first time, we appointed a chief of defense staff who is above the chiefs. I was a fourth chief, but I am below the chiefs. So, that is the difference. But I made a couple of presentations. I got an opportunity to make a couple of presentations to the Prime Minister. We pushed for this particular thing and that happened. Had I gone to Northern Command, I would have been doing a bit more of the same. I have been into counter-terrorism all my life, I would have been doing that. But here, a very different field, a very different integration of three services. I got exposure uh, to interact with Chief of Defence staffs or the equivalents all over the world in those two years. And, and, and now the final result is that we have a Chief of Defence staff. I, I, I always say, and I was telling Mathibai once you talk about it, I feel that mother has been kind to me. Mother has blessed me more than my birth and the sentence that I used to him, I think mother has been always been partial to me. I do not, I am uh, I'm agnostic by, for rituals, I, I do not pray, but I, I will observe the Navratra or even the uh, Rosa during Ramzan because I have Muslim troops in Jammu and Kashmir Light Infantry Regiment when I am with my soldiers. But then I see that more as my duty. I'm, I'm, I'm being factual about it. I see myself, I like to see myself at least as a Karam Yogi. 
I I am the type who would like to I, I don't uh, I don't see any contradictions in the fact that I kill by profession but yet last week I had tear in my eye when I was seeing the movie 1917 there are a couple of very poignant moments if someone has seen the movie I don't see a contradiction in that that I my son said that he cried I said yeah I have a tear in my eye because I relate with that scene that I have lived a few times in my life when he says I'm when the soldier asks the other am I going to die is somebody else is that his buddy then he gives a pause and says yes then in next sentence he says will you write to will you write to my mom for me i've been there done that so i i what i'm trying to say being a ruthless soldier or a leader of men is one thing being a human being i don't see a contradiction in that i can have a drink enjoy a drink in the evening and do yoga vyas in the morning i don't see contradiction in that and i i don't pray but I have picked up this from a, I think my father said this to me in a very young impressionable age. Eternal gratitude is the biggest prayer, and I think I just live by that. Just a simple, sincere thank you, and thank you very much for your patience and listening to me. Thank you.
Operation Woodrose, Cactus Lily, all the Operation Cactus and all that. When you give it a name, it tends to get out. When there is no name, then you, what are you referring to? You refer to a date and place, and place I haven't told anybody, except those, <laughs> I was going to say the number, except the few soldiers I'd say, who actually went. Nobody knows the exact place where we went. And you'll have to please allow me not to talk about it. So the fact is, that is the reason that I did not give a name. And I thought there was great sense in it. This is later on a nationalistic thing, surgical strike and up. Sir, I can't tell you more about uh, what we did, how we did. It would not be correct. Now, even I'm retired, but And it has come in newspaper and uh, here. Yes. Uh, trust me, sir. No, trust me, sir. A lot of it is inaccurate. I will give you an example. I have, I have gone up on stage and spoke like this is a different talk. I have gone up and spoken only about this in Balakot and panel discussion that I tell you what I said to the media once. They said, sir, but this is known. There is a shallow Vishnu Swaman. There are some very deputed uh, press people. They said, sir, but that, tell me it was very shallow. Then why were the helicopters used? But they would come. And I told them, listen, you are totally wrong. No helicopters were used. So like I, I said one thing from Helicopters were not used at all. So what comes out in the press is really not accurate. Somebody in, I remember in India today, there is an eight page or a six page article. In the first one, they've drawn drawings. They've actually given arrow here, arrow there. That is between the media and you who are their buyers. The soldier is out of it. Staff and right. why was it needed in the present context? I like you so much already. <laughs> Thank you. No, because you said something that has been my passion for the last three years. I didn't do much about it till I was a court commander. I was only gunning, literally. But, uh, okay, very briefly, and try to put it simply. He asked me a question, if those of you couldn't hear it, as to why I like it so much. Is, he says, can you tell us a little bit more about the chief of integrated, uh, chief of defense staff and uh, what is his role that he can play? Very briefly, at a very simple level, Army, Navy, Air Force are three services. In some countries, there is a fourth, like America has Marines. After World War II, it was felt that these services, they were fighting so much within themselves. President Truman has written, President Truman has said, if our army and navy, navy did not fight, uh, uh, fought the enemy as hard as they fought between themselves, the war would have ended much earlier. Today, please add Air Force in that. So it's Army, Navy and Air Force. That time it was Army and Navy. But no, Mandy landings were a schmozzle. Ask the military man what happened. You, the victory is, uh, history is written by the victor, so you don't know what, uh, what actually happened. Uh, getting back to the point, so after World War II, it was decided by, that it was found that it is better that we integrate these three services because they are just, it is a very different animal when they start doing it uh, separately. 66 or 67 countries, I'm now coming to your question, 66 or 67 countries have integrated their forces. All major militaries have integrated their forces, that is Army, Navy and Air Force. We were the last man standing, India was the last country standing that we were doing it all single verticals, Army, Navy, Air Force, separate chiefs and separate things. We always, and Imagine, we were the, sec we are the second largest armed forces in the world. We have two active borders. No one else, how many countries have active borders? We are fighting every day with Pakistan. We have tussles every day with China. Fortunately, we are not exchanging bullets that much with China. Then, all three are nuclear countries. For God's sake, how can it actually get worse? So the point is, we needed to integrate. But, the leadership on one hand, the military. So we are responsible to. The military created barriers for themselves. Everybody wanted their own turf. So now, one has been pushing for this. 
same person that been pushing. The bureaucrats didn't want it. The leadership didn't want it. Ignorant leadership didn't want to, you know, sort of take a strong step. The military very happily wanted their own turfs. The army, navy, air force. So we finally have a chief of defence staff. Integration between three forces. As a developing country, India cannot afford to have duplication and triplication of facilities. So this is going to lend a lot of synergy. Get our act together, and we'll be more effective as a force. Sir, let me ask you a question. Do you feel that in India, if there is an integrated uh, defense chief, he will take over? Do you feel today? Do you actually get a feeling that in India it will take over? Okay, since you are a uh, little uh, hesitant to answer that, I think Indian Army, when I say Army, our Navy and Air Force are smaller than junk, so when I, I mean all of them. We can take pride that in our country, the Indian Army is totally, totally apolitical. Governments have changed. Our, we have never had any shift in loyalties because the army serves the country and not a political party. Unlike neighboring countries, we have never ever showed that kind of inclination. In fact, today if you cast your mind back, whether it is flood or earthquake, whether it is a train accident where the railway body falls in this thing, whether a child goes into a bore well, if humanitarian assistance is required, if someone is pulled out from an avalanche, everywhere it is the army and air force put together, who go out? I mean, don't you see we have a we have a SDRF, State uh, Disaster Relief Force, we have an NDRF, National Disaster Relief Battalions, but why is it army that's called out all the time? What we are doing in JNK today, what we did in Punjab, what we did in Mizoram, what we are also doing in Manipur today, is not our business at all. Police cannot handle it and we are called in there. So, the point I am trying to make, whether it is a bad situation or a, a, a disaster, a natural disaster, it is always that army is called out. So, army actually is, is the last uh, discipline organization left. It is actually the first responder and the last assault. So I don't, and I, I, having served four decades in the army, we never even have that information. And let me put your mind at rest by last sentence. If army wanted to do it, we can't do it. Our country is too vast and varied. What will you take over? I will go and take over the parliament. I say to the Rashtrapati Bhavan, so what? The states, states don't listen to the prime minister, they won't listen to somebody in the parliament. <laughs> Sir, uh, because, 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 in Laos, the chief of army is a brigadier, the defense minister is a major general. So, field mark, rank is different and post is different. In India, we have appointed a general as the CDS. Field marshal is a five-star rank, this general is a four-star rank. General Dunford in the US is chairman, joint chief of staff. He is a four-star general, just like General Bipin Rao. Field Marshals, we don't have Field Marshals anywhere in the world today. Field Marshals were a World War II carryover. During World War, we appointed Field Marshals because different armies came together, Allies especially, when they had the Italians, the Germans, the, I'm sorry, uh, the Italians, the British, the French, they all coming together. Some of them, they sent a general. It was under a general, a four star full general. This is not a left general. They also set a general. So if you have to appoint somebody to coordinate them, they had to promote somebody. They called him the field marshal and they made him a field marshal. This happened in World War I, World War II also. Otherwise, after World War II, after Mombat and Nandala, we just finished. Now there are no field marshals. In 1971, we gave field marshals rank to Manik Shah. It was more decorated. 
and uh, to Field Marshal Karepa, posthumously after he died. So these are most more like decorations. So CDS is different. He is affected as a as a general. Yes. Little louder, are you clear? Right. That's a very intelligent question, sir. I mean it. We are all uh, three countries, we are nuclear countries. I agree. I think if the world was ever close to a nuclear catastrophe, I mean, we'll not talk about Nagasaki, Hiroshima, very It was 1962, the Bay of Pigs. That's the time between America and USSR. It was diffused between them. Were we ever close? I think the blunt and the short answer is no. No. Despite what we keep saying, saber rattling is one thing, but to actually think that you are going to pull a trigger, for what? We don't have to fear Pakistan. To that extent, they are not going to be able to contain them conventional man, in a conventional manner. China and India are not really fighting fighting. That means we are not really straining bullets or missiles at each other. We are not getting there. We have tussles. Even in commercial world we have tussles, but that's it. Our fear is only if Pakistan on one hand feels, feels so pushed that they do it. But uh, I hope some sanity will remain in Pakistan as it does now because Pakistan really needs the goodwill of the world to stay afloat and we are all aware of what I am talking about. I don't think they can get it. What is the risk of a nuclear weapon falling in the hand of a terrorist? Alright. So that's, to my mind, that sentence is also a creation of the analysts, armchair analysts and the media. There is no such thing as nuclear weapons falling in the arm of terrorists, let me assure you. Do you, would you anyone realize that, please appreciate, what is a nuclear facility? Forget what you see in James Bond movies. A nuclear facility has so many checks and balances, no one person can fire it off. If I am the commandant of the base in where nuclear weapons are fired, even if I turn rogue, I cannot activate it. The, the football as it is called, that the American president, somebody is carrying behind the briefcase or whatever you see, something going with Mr. Modi. That's the way the order will emanate. But if this order cannot start anything on its own, there will be, I mean, I'm just giving you a wrong figure, there will be eight levels of checks and balances. So no nuclear, no terrorist can take one thing and say that now I've got it. He hasn't got anything. He can kill a few people in trying to get them to for something, but he can't. There are people dispersed. So nobody, it doesn't fall into somebody's hand. It requires such specialized stuff. It, it has to be housed, quartered, centrifuges, uh, heavy water, and so many things. So nobody can actually get it. Yes. What can happen is you a terrorist can find some radioactive waste. Radioactive waste can be found in nuclear reactors, in some other, even in some medicinal uses, there is some radioactive being used. So an unscrupulous person can get his hands on some radioactive waste. Now what is radioactive? If a radioactive waste is in a small capsule container this size, now it is still contained. But if it is open in this room, it contaminates all of us. So what can happen is that you take somebody gets hold of some radioactive waste, puts it in an IED or a bomb and blasts it off. So instead of just this room, it will affect all of Puducherry. So that is, is the real danger. It will still not have shock and blast, but radioactive waste can create problems uh, of low but lingering levels uh, even for generations. But that's all that a terrorist can actually do. Again, I'm imagining a lot of things to put facts in perspective. What risk is there of a radioactive waste? There, your guess is as good as mine, sir. Especially about terrorism, 
someone gets something from somewhere, puts it somewhere, it's really not a military mine. What can I tell you where the next blast will be? Will it be under a train or an aircraft? Terrorism, that is why terrorism is terrorism, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, very, very, very good question, ma'am. Role of women. In our country, we know of Rani Lakshmi Bai. I can, I can talk about a few more names without getting into history. Uh, aren't we so proud? Sorry? <laughs> That's right. Tanya Shergi. Okay. At the end, I'll make a comment on Tanya Shergi though. About, not Tanya Shergi as a person, about this phenomena that we're talking about. So, ladies and gentlemen, and children. <laughs> so, uh, women have been in the forefront in our uh, consciousness, in our military sphere, in our country over the ages. But today, as far as their role is concerned, we would like to see their participation increasing. We've already started at the last two decades or more. There are officers in all fields. There are fighter pilots. There are different fields. The only thing that some people talk about is that in the combat field, in the combat arms, they are there only restricted to engineers and signals, but not in infantry, not in submarines. It's just that we are getting there. It will take a while for a social, social structure is different. And also don't, you know, don't forget that the names that we talk of, whether it's, uh, you know, touched by other names that we talk of, they were at a different perch and not a common soldier. They were also not a soldier. Us, in a post that we live, we have to create conditions for our, uh, for women to get they do respect that they get the That's the only thing. We are getting there. It's increasing. And we are very, very, very proud of all this. Tanya Shirdi and many such names. Actually, I have held my pen back and I can perhaps show you a tweet in my phone which I have held back as a draft several times. A couple of times I wanted to write this. I take pride in all these women and officers. But I want to tell everybody public at large and my fraternity, everyone tries to be very enthusiastic about it. What I want to talk about is uh, they are, were selected to be a soldier or a defense attaché, there was a lady also who went to Russia or whatever else that you know catches the media, they were selected to do that because they were found capable as an officer. It did not matter whether she was a woman or a man, that's what the Indian Army does. We see capability. This is not, we are not here for, on, on grounds of uh, like a, uh, you know, we are not trying to do this so much quota for women and so much quota for men. Everyone is equal, you get selected on your capabilities. But yes, we are very proud of such women also, as, as we are proud of men. Yeah. So 
that is our record. Are there no human rights? Have I seen that there are no human rights violations? No, sir, I can't. There will always be aberrations. But army is very strict to clamp down on its own, where case in a civil court will drag on for 20 years. We will punish that man in six months, one year. We will finish it. I have actually, as a, as a, as a lieutenant general, I have put two officers and four soldiers in behind bars. Army mein, uh, civil mein to court ke is chalta hi raha tha. Even, um, you know, so many. Yes, sir. So I was saying that uh, if you have to read the media, then Rawat has one record saying that uh, if they make an order, they will take a few days. Now, from a, I'm not, I mean, I know it's a political decision if it's taken at all. Yes, sir. But is the Indian army capable of fighting in a mountainous level with the conditions that it's really difficult to actually take over the UK? Short answer, yes. No, oh, but I must stop you. It is not about taking an objective, sir. It's about holding it after that. In Kargil, Pakistan Army came and sat down on those important posts that are overlooking our national highway from Dras to Ladakh Lake. And they would obstruct our road movement. It's not about taking it. Who sits there after that? How do they sustain themselves during winters? It is tough to maintain that. Let us say for a minute, let's not question it for a minute. Let's say we've taken over POK. Let me, let me explain to you or try to point out things which you wouldn't have thought of. Because everyone talks about taking over. Okay, taken over. Now what do we do? We have to sustain it logistically. We have to sustain the people, we have to sustain it politically, we have to sustain it diplomatically. So the world will let us redraw a boundary, question number one. Oh, Pakistan keeps shouting, Kashmir banega Pakistan. So will they take over Kashmir? Will the world allow it? Diplomatically, politically, can the world allow it? Can we sustain it? Ek cylinder to sabalta nahi hai saab. Again, there will be nare bazi there. What will we do? Those people who don't want to be a part of India, you will assimilate them and you will police them. How will we hold on to them? By force. What do we do with that land? So taking, sir, this like marching in, a few garrisons, there will be attack, a bloodbath. Yes, Indian army is capable of doing it. We will get some success and some places we'll have reverses, some places we'll have more casualties. Let's not talk about that. The point is, these statements like uh, you ask, sir, uh, what if it happens for within the limits of ignorance? My ignorance, I told you what I did. There are several aspects that I have not thought of. How to hold on to that? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Slightly? Yeah, I 
phone or something. Let me ask you a question. All of you watch TV channels. How many of you watch Dude Russian? Show of hands, please. TV News. Yes, yes, ma'am. No, no, please keep that up. Yes, ma'am, you said it rightly. There were six women. The, the risk that you run, I'm coming to that. The risk that you run, ma'am, and ladies and gentlemen, the risk that you run by having my own channel or my own bulletin, they take, take it as Sarkari and that doesn't hold interest. Whether it is a soldier or a citizen, you want to hear news in a different manner and you feel Dudarshan is not the government ka mouthpiece hai. So that's what happens. That's the risk you run. That is the risk. That is why CNN, BBC and Al Jazeera will be more popular. So you are right on your saying, but the answers are not so simple. There are no easy answers. Social media is taken over the world by a storm. Soldiers can't remain in the world. It is not that. We have to, we have to learn to embrace these enablers. In fact, use them to our advantage somehow. And that's happening in different ways. But we will always remain with these pitfalls. We have to be disciplined. One last question. Yeah, one last question. About? Yeah. Okay, Siachen Glacier. He asked me about Siachen Glacier. So, uh, it's a very strategically located area in Ladakh region of India. The altitudes vary from, let's say, 19, 20 thousand feet upwards. Uh, I said it so easily. My, my unit captured the highest attack in the world. We did at 21,153 feet, 8,000 feet more than you are at Everest. And people go on expeditions, we go with weapons. Anyway, so Siachen Glacier is a very important strategic piece of territory. It, uh, you know, I, when I say overlooks, it's only a military part, it's not literally overlooking the street, but it overlooks strategically in, in, in the strategic sense. The Karakoram highway and that path that China is connecting to Pakistan too. It also is a bowway into Ladakh. Why is it a bone of contention? It is a bone of contention because when India and Pakistan were demarcating, or we were making these two countries and then we were demarcating the what is now the line of control in 48, when we came to a certain place, it was so tough to climb beyond that. So when we came to that NJ9842, it's called NJ NJ9842 is the map coordination point. Coordinate where you stop and they said we can't go further. They were just not prepared to walk up. There was so much snow, even in summers, they couldn't walk up. So he said from here on the line will run north and left it. That ambiguous area where it was left in 19, early 1980s, I was a young officer there. We started pushing our expeditions, so both went and sat on a certain side, India and Pakistan. So wherever we sat down, it is now called AGPL. You have heard of LOC, right? Line of control. So there is something called AGPL. It is 121 kilometers long. Any guesses? AGPL? A? Sorry? Absolutely. AGPL, actual ground position line. So, this is line of control, ratified, this is actual. Where who is sitting is mine. Tomorrow if I manage to sit here, this is mine. This is also mine, like that. So you actually sit here, actual, actual position. It is very tough. That's the first part. We have had a couple of battles there. Uh, we've gone through ups and downs of trying to de-escalate, can we withdraw from CRC, all those things happening. So that is, do I answer your questions? Do I answer your questions? So, thank you, sir, for the, so thank you once again for a very grounded, balanced, inspiring, and touching uh, talk as well. Thank you. And we hope you will come back again amongst us. Thank I have choice. <laughs> and I, 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 always, I told you that first time I came here with my father, and today I am so happy that I am here with my two sons, my wife and my sons. My wife will be the company in all, every year we've been here and I give a talk in school. Uh, and it is also my elder son's birthday today. Stand up, both of you. Can I, everyone can give me their message. They've been here with me earlier, they were young children. So today, as we say,
see here one fat. Best to live here always. We can have some time, but we all.